Hello everybody, I'm just about ready to get started. Welcome Murphy and Calvisham. Let me check one thing before we go into our main topic. I think that is good to go then. So the purpose of today's stream is to start off by talking about quests. This has been requested several times. In particular for some of the new players that have been joining us. So we are going to talk about a lot of things. I will tell you what this will not really cover. If you're looking for ultimate hunts and stuff like that, we are not going to go into those details. This video is aimed more at going through, making sure if you've not really played PSO much or it's been a while since you touched it, what quests are kind of fun which ones are sort of quote-unquote meta, and a little bit of breakdown of some of the probably lesser-known quests to new players that are extremely important to know about. So why don't we start off with creating a quest? Can you believe there is actually... You could fail creating the quest properly? So people that are veterans of PSO know what I'm talking about. When you go to create a game at the lobby, you will be prompted amongst the many options initially whether or not you want to create a game in normal mode or not. Or if you don't select it, it'll just say normal. Which, to like everybody else, you would think if it says normal, that that's what you should choose, because it says normal, and you want to play the game normally. But Sega team is having a laugh at you, unfortunately. If you are playing single player, you need to please, please select one player only as the vote option. So what are the differences between normal and one player only when you go to create a game in order to even get started into the quest? Well, if you're playing episode four, the answer is the enemies are tougher and you don't get anything. If you're playing episode one and two, you do get slightly more experience. But be warned, it is not worth the XP difference. Just play one player only. We're talking like 40% or more health and other statistics, which makes it an absolutely miserable time to attempt to solo that. However, if you do want people to join you, maybe you have a friend, maybe people are offering to level you, you do need to leave the game in normal mode. There's a couple things that also gives access to uh, between the two. There's entire different categories available to one player only. Um, unfortunately, most of them are not all that great, but we'll be touching upon that in a moment. But, generally speaking, if you want to clump... Weirdly enough, I know this sounds illogical, and I thought I'd just bring this up before we even go into some more of the details. If you're looking for the story of the game, for whatever reason, they split it between there are things known as the government missions, which, confusingly enough, is not at the quest counter <laughs> where you start the game. In uh, episodes one and four, you have to go into a little side area, and it's the, it's the room known as the, the, the principal room, and you have to talk to him and the people around him in order to advance the quests. In episode two, there is a woman manning the bridge, which is kind of in the center of the map. You take a teleporter to go there. And for whatever reason, there is also single-player only quests. Both of them have plot. I recommend trying a little bit of both in order to get probably the full experience. Reading what the chat is saying before I go further. Enemies have anywhere between 25 to 50% less health, tend to have lower resistance, and a few solo specific quests available compared to normal type game. So we were just talking a little bit about the quests, but you're right. So it's not an exact percentage. It will vary, but you will be miserable. <laughs> I was guarantee it. If you want XP, it's better just to pump up a difficulty than play it on multiplayer mode, as it were. Um, there's also some small differences between the modes. I don't really want to go into it in full detail here. That's not the point of the video. But just be aware, you will generally have more things like iframes in single player mode and damage, like set damage from enemies will be much lower. So if you want to experience the game in solo play, please, please set it to one player only. Just please. <laughs> please, please, please change it. So let's introduce some concepts and then we're going to talk a little bit more about some more episode specific things. So you may or may not see when you go to create the game that people are naming them in kind of odd fashions. 
and you might see like you might see something like a PW4 or you might see like a TTF. We'll talk about some of these quests in more detail. However, one thing if you're just looking to play random quests in general, if you just want to see what people may or may not be grinding as the current meta, quote unquote, um, you could do a command by hitting F11 by default or double tapping space to enter the chat mode, hitting it slash HVR. <laughs> it's perfect for solo play, something like that. And it will tell you a series of quests. It stands for the Hunter Boost Road. It's from another PSO game in terms of how it handles it. Essentially, if you complete one quest each in the list, so let's say there's three quests total, you beat each of them once, you start to accumulate things like a drop anything rate, a rare drop rate up, and experience up if you happen to be not an ultimate and under level 100. So if you do get bored of the government quests or you do get bored of some of the potential solo quests, this might not be a bad way to get experience. Now we're going to talk about many, many better ways potentially to get it, but you know, some people will find joy in just trying new quests and that will give a little bit of extra motivation. Now, one thing I would say before I go too much further, I want to touch upon... I guess some single-player quests of interest. I will say from the standpoint of playing the game, my recommendation for brand new characters and brand new players is not the quests that have the most enemies. It's not the quests that have the most bosses. You want to spend a lot of time in the game leveling your mag. I'm going to be very, 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 very specific about this. You need time in order to get more powerful. You can you can power level your character, but if that thing does not have stats that buff your damage, you're going to be doing nothing. So you, you could have somebody rush you to like level 80, which is what's needed to go into ultimate difficulty, but you will be, you know, kind of helpless. So I recommend taking some of the slower pace quests. And in fact, I recommend doing a lot of the quests we're about to mention in normal mode itself, even if you already have another character. The reason you want to do this is there are things you can unlock that are basically full-time services that will help you for the rest of your character career once you have unlocked them. So what am I talking about with some of these things? Well, there is a side mechanic that you can aim for for a new character. Sorry, Chad is writing a lot in here. Yeah, they're giving a more breakdown specific point of the Hunter Boost Road. Your effective points are equal to the quest you have the least points in. That's a good point to mention that if you do like 10 of one quest and one another, it will not give you the bonus of completing the 10 quests worth. You have to complete a full cycle for it to count. One second chat. So, let's talk about things that you should be doing, I guess, to unlock for the future quests. So, one thing I want to mention is that under one of the single-player-only options, there's something known as side story. You can get items for completing the side stories and the government quests. Um, in fact, if you were just really unsure what to get in general, completing them at least should give you something based off the difficulty. However... I will state, there are a few very specific quests that you should do. And the reason you want to do them is because you unlock the ability to convert things known as enemy parts into weapons. Now, most of them are not like phenomenal or anything, but I feel like it gives a little more variety, especially when you're playing solo, you have potentially more powerful gear. You'll find them at some point between your journey from normal to ultimate. And there are some things in Ultimate that are absolutely worth going back to one of these quests I'm about to mention and using them in order to get better gear. So I, I will say some highlights are weapons like the Bringer's Arm in particular is probably one of the most used guns for me endgame. And even though you get it at a higher difficulty, it still comes from a quest I did all the way back in normal mode. So let's talk about it. If you complete the following quests, Battle Training, Claiming a Stake, Magnitude of Metal, Secret Delivery, and Doc's Secret Plan. This will allow you to choose a quest. Either you could choose, I believe, Dr. Otso's Research or Unsealed Door. And you'll be able to talk to an NPC there. 
that NPC is essentially going to let you take any of those enemy parts, like let's say a sorcerer's right arm or something like that, and convert it into something more useful as you go through the game, like a sorcerer's game. So they may not be specific to your character. They could be force weapons, ranger weapons, hunter weapons, but it, I think it's worth checking out. And if you happen to do that, as I said before, there are some really good ones to get. So doing it early on is recommended. However, I will state, if you go through and do these quests, if you happen to clear one of these quests, it's going to be very annoying to go back to them. So I would make a decision before you clear that chain of side stories, whether or not you want to just hold somebody there at a point where you could just go back to it very easily, start the quest, talk to the NPC, leave. Or if you are going to commit, complete all of them and then restart to get to it. So I do want you to think about that a little bit, because I know some people don't realize that that's a thing. If you clear the quest, you can't really re-clear it, which is kind of annoying because it's part of a quest chain. PSO things, chat. PSO things. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Essentially, what will happen is you can talk to an NPC there. And you could do a couple different things with him. He'll show up in, I think, a couple other quests that we'll talk about. Chat's bringing up Bringer's Arm, Brands, Lotron S, Red Blades, or Solid Enemy Parts. Uh, unfortunately, those are mostly ultimate level. <laughs> They're saying useful even in ultimate. You literally get almost all of those in ultimate only, unfortunately. But, you know, even things like a Hilda Bear Cane very early on will probably be beneficial than having nothing in some scenarios. Or things like the Grass Assassin Daggers are not terrible. Yeah, they're, they're not bad. They're above just generic items. I don't know if I would invest a whole ton into it, but just be aware you could go to those places in order to convert the monster parts. One other thing I want to bring up. Yeah, once, yeah, one thing I'm just verifying real quick is we're here. So... S-feats and very hearts get used up into ult, I think. Yeah, I was, I was about to... I was actually double-checking that, Travis. It is so funny that you said that. Because I was like, there are sets of daggers that are pretty useful in lower difficulties. They're worth checking to see if you could get the uh, S-feat arm, I think it was called, or something like that. I hope you're doing well, Travis. So, one downside to these items is that you are going to get them at all 0%. So what that means is uh, there are four major attributes in the game and, and then also hit percentage for each of the main area types slash enemy types of the game of your native, your caves, your machine place, and uh, dark for the ruins. So there are ways to improve them if you do get a decent one. And that will involve going to a specific character in episode four. I guess before I fully jump into that, let me take one step back. So if you are truly starting for the first time, you could play up to this point. You could play all those quests. You could play all the side story things. I would say from a difficulty perspective, episode, it, it's more or less you should do the episodes in order. So when you've cleared all these episode one quests, you can maybe potentially skip ahead to episode four. I will state, people might think that you have to complete all of episode 2 before you do episode 4. I will let you know, from a story perspective, you should probably play it in that order. From a difficulty perspective, episode 2 kind of sucks. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be real biased on it. I really do not like episode 2. It has some of the harder government quests, and honestly... I don't recommend doing a whole ton of them, so you're not going to hear a lot of Episode 2 hype <laughs> when we get further into the list. But if you go from Episode 1 to Episode 4, yeah, it expects you to farm way too much for sure. Um, with just a little bit of experience under your belt, I think you could start doing potentially the story mode for Episode 4. Now, what I would recommend is you kind of save it for when you're towards the tail end of Level 20 to potentially do this, because you want to go through it fairly quickly. You don't want to be, like, struggling to hit things or 
you know, you don't want to go in there with literally no equipment into episode four, whereas like episode one, you could just get away with it because it's episode one. Um, but if you do play through the story, if you play specifically all the way to the government quest known as The Chosen, which I believe is 9-5 in the government counter, you don't have to complete the episode four story. You don't even have to complete the episode four boss. It will unlock the ability to upgrade said weapons by gambling photon crystals. Photon crystals being a currency you could get while playing episode four. So I will just briefly state that it only costs one to get a 10% hit. After that, it decreases by 20% chance so the second second time you attempt to upgrade it, it's an 80% chance of success to get to 20, then 60, 40, 20, etc. So a lot of our future discussions will be about getting these kinds of alternate currencies. And having some of these upgraded, like even like a G Assassin Saber as an example, is honestly like kind of decent for low-end stuff. Yeah, chance just repeating stuff I mentioned. So I just want you to keep that in mind. A lot of these quests will give alternative currencies, whether from direct quest completion or from natural enemy drops in the game itself. So I will try to draw attention to them as we go forward. But just be aware, you can then, once you've completed the government quest, I forgot to mention, you have to specifically go to a shop quest known as Claire's Deal 5. And from there, you can speak to, I believe his name is Montague in order to upgrade the weapons with hit percentage. So I just wanted to draw attention to those particular ones. We'll talk about more uh, shop quests towards the end, but I figured this one was so specifically tied into the story and the side quests, I felt like it was kind of worth mentioning for beginner players. Now, one thing I'm not really gonna talk about since I feel it kind of falls outside of the scope for beginner players are the episode two quests for S ranks. We'll probably save that for a future video. That's for people that are really comfortable with the game. It's not something I can recommend for new players. It's something you kind of got to practice, practice, practice. So I, I will make mention of it that I did not forget it. I just don't recommend doing that <laughs> as a new player. It's something you do when you are truly comfortable with the game. Yeah, it's like, it, I, I can't recommend playing that particular thing. So let's talk about some more generic quests that are not specific to any particular episode, and then we'll go into more of an episode breakdown, where I promise we'll go into more quest details. So there are some very important event quests that are so good most of the time, or the event bonuses are so strong that playing the game during these time periods will not only allow you to get a ton of experience and also potentially a lot of items, it just generally means that even just leveling a basic character can reward you for things that are just so, so good for your character level. So what am I talking about? Well, so we'll start, I guess, quote unquote, in order, if we're, if we're thinking about it from a season standpoint. Easter. Right, well, actually, before that, I'm sorry. Hold on. <laughs> Let's go back one. Valentine's event. I know, we gotta back up slightly. Valentine's event. So, generally, what we've seen so far in the past couple of years, specific to the Affinia server, these kinds of bonuses, playing with more people equals more rare bonuses. It just gives like a small boost of things. It's a nice event. There's a couple of, you know, filler quests if you want to do the handing out of chocolates. People are interested in those kinds of things. It's there for you. It it's not bad. It, it, can, it's, it can net you some rares that you might be going for if you take a peek at the drop table and decide you're interested in stuff. The big seasonal one, though, is not uh, Valentine's. I know, I got so excited for Easter. Soon, chat, soon. But uh, it's the, the Easter quest. Not quest. The Easter event. There's no specific quest for Easter. However, just by killing enemies in general, they keep changing the rare rate, so I'm not going to list the rare rate. It, it's, it's different every year. I'm not, I don't care. <laughs> but just killing enemies will result in potentially, instead of them dropping their normal pool of items, whether it's a weapon, their rare, a couple of monomates or whatever, they instead drop Easter eggs. And the Easter eggs are a great currency that you can use in order to trade in for basically 
almost anything in the game, shy of the uber rares. <laughs> there are so many useful items you could trade in. You could, for example, for a couple eggs, you could get more materials that permanently increase your character stats. For a couple eggs, you can get uh, 50 hit weapons of the very strong and good variety. So even if you're not playing like very hard or ultimate to potentially get the better end of the special types of weapons, you could be a normal, pick up an egg, random gamble it, and suddenly you have a 50 hit hell handgun and you're like, oh, I can suddenly do so many more things with it. So you can end up with a potentially really strong set of basic common weapons. They even offer the ability to gamble for random useful units, including but not limited to, depending on the year. Again, they change it each year. Things like V501, which is great for status ailments. You got V801 for casting. You got different frames, like Electro Frame, I think I've seen in there a couple times. You even got joke weapons for people that like that. They got cosmetics. There's so many things. It is basically like if you build the character around that point, play for a little bit, you can just get so far ahead that you could just go through your basic game plan of going through the side stories and government missions and still be completely fine for later endgame stuff. So in order to cash them in, make sure to check out the shops, depending on the event. So for Easter specifically, there is the Easter shop in episode one. And it is just phenomenal. It is phenomenal. You could play almost anything, including free roam, which is a weird statement to say that you could do it if you want to, if you just want to play the game and see what the dungeons are like, you still get rewarded. So we'll talk about, we kind of have a lot of backloaded events, unfortunately. There's not really too much after Easter. There's kind of a big break until we start getting into August. So this is probably the biggest pool. Honestly, if I were to pick a time for the best time to join, it's probably during the anniversary event. So somewhere between August and September, again, it varies when they celebrate it. There will be a server-wide celebration. There will be nothing but custom quests available. Normally when you go to the, the quest counter, you'll see during an event like this, specifically a quest tab called event, that will list out all these other types of quests that you could do. All of them, I, I think pretty much all of them. I haven't verified one for one, but if you're looking to hunt anything, or if you're just looking to get a decent amount of experience, they're aimed to be shorter quests that end up giving badges, which are traded in a very similar manner to Easter eggs. They're a little more complicated in the fact that they have a four tier system, platinum being basically impossible to find, uh, but you'll get a mix of bronze, silver, and gold, and depending on the value of said badge, you potentially could upgrade it from bronze to silver, silver to gold, and I wish you could upgrade gold to platinum, but you can, unfortunately. So, the intent of it is just another way to end up with the bulk of items. This one, it's less gambling with them than the Easter Shop can be, uh, but there's a different set of items, so it's worth also playing during those times, and again, if you're looking to refresh, have like a fresh experience, there's almost nothing but custom quests during Affinia during that particular time frame. And the more you participate in these events, at least on the higher difficulties, I don't know, maybe they'll revert it in the future. Uh, it'll start unlocking bonuses for the server, including but not limited to things like experience boosts, rare ups, item drop up, rare monster ups, special quests uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, potentially items like Photon Spheres, which is a true endgame item. It really just depends. So, also a really solid time to join. The other really solid time to join, and again, <laughs> conveniently enough, if you played the anniversary event from about August to September, conveniently from about September to October, uh, end of October I mean, is the Halloween events. So, this one does have a drop. It's random chance like the Easter egg. So just playing anything will net you something. But you'll get a Halloween cookie. I know, I've complained about this on streams. Why is it a cookie for Halloween? Why of all the things they could have picked, they chose not to make Christmas have Christmas cookies and they gave cookie to Halloween. I'll never understand it. But you could use that to access special quests under the convenient enough quest tab for Halloween, like literally when you go to the quest counter, that's what it says. 
You pay one of these as an entrance fee, and it is set bonuses. I don't think they'll ever let it overflow like they did a couple years ago. So for now, we'll just call them set bonuses, where you'll basically be getting double experience, double rare, double item drop, double rare chance. And these are also a really great way to potentially level a character. Now, you know, I would not blow necessarily all of them if you're on the lowest possible difficulties, but it's just an option for those looking to get ahead or just looking to potentially benefit from having all of those bonuses active at once. And then, could you believe it, chat? We come all the way to Christmas, <laughs> which is December to, to basically a little bit of January, which again is really unfair how backloaded the events are. Um... But they'll unlock a series of quests that I think are actually fairly hard to complete for a new player, just to warn you. So they tried to introduce a new quest type last year, hopefully they keep it around, known as Solstice Snafu. This particular quest is meant to be a more solo mobile version of what is an infamous event known as the Christmas Fiascos. So if you're looking to get coal, which again, there's so many currencies in this game. So the coal you could trade in for presents. Presents are random items. Depending on the difficulty, you get different item pools. So while you can't necessarily get something as crazy as you could during Easter or maybe even the anniversary event with your badges, it's slightly more common or at least guaranteed that you can get these items, quote unquote, or at least the chance of getting items. So take it as you will. If you're comfortable and you have a decent group with you, I do recommend checking out some of the Christmas fiascos. Episode 1's is fairly difficult. I'm gonna be honest with you, it takes you through every single area of Episode 1, and it is brutal. It is very brutal. If you are suboptimal in level or gear, I will say you probably not have a great time. Unfortunately, this quest has one of the things that makes it hard to recommend quests in this game, which is you can't really telepipe, which is very annoying. <laughs> Especially if you are a new player and you're like, wow, there's 40 items on the floor. Let me just go back to town. Oh, <laughs> so just to warn you, it's more meant for higher level players, but I thought I'd just draw attention to it as you could casually join one of those games and potentially get some presents at the time. Um. To hand in those quests, there's the Christmas event shop specifically to trade in the coal. That's about it. There isn't like a shop list. Like if you go, for example, to the anniversary quest shop, which will be designated as the anniversary shop, um, where you could talk to different vendors and trade the badges in for sets of items. Uh, Christmas is just one person. It's not as exciting. However, you never know you could get in the presents. You could get anything ranging from a Photon Drop to Uber Rares. So the range of what it can give you is pretty wide. Some of it requires you to be in higher difficulties, but hey, it is what it is when it comes to those kinds of things. I think that covers most of the different kinds of event quests that you're likely to encounter. Again, I consider those higher priority once you've gotten a few levels from doing some solo quest stuff and or government quests, that you should be able to basically join those. So now, we're going to come into a more detailed point-for-point -point discussion. We're going to go episode to episode. Actually, I'm sorry, I want to warn you one more thing about Christmas Fiasco. So Christmas Fiasco episode 1, very difficult, but doable. Difficult, but doable. Episode 2 is like masochism incarnate. Like, you could do it, I just don't recommend it. <laughs> just, I, I, I don't recommend it at all. Episode 4, if you're a force, is actually pretty fun. I will warn you for players that have not played the quest before, the designers of the quest play a dirty little trick on you that will prevent you from actually completing the quest and getting your guaranteed coal for qu completing those quests. Note, if you complete Solstice Snafu, it gives less than the Christmas Fiasco's because it's meant to be a weaker version of Christmas Fiasco. So in addition to not being able to telepipe in any of the Christmas Fiasco quests across any of the episodes, they decide that the final room of Christmas Fiasco, where you're kind of a cave and you can see a laser barrier in the distance, they decide it's okay to spawn Quadrabulu, I like to call it, where they put four Gertabulus around the spawn point. 
it is ridiculously unfair for new players and i will explicitly warn you about that quest it is really fun if you're a force all the way through unless you die in that final room then i'm just gonna be like it might actually be faster to reset <laughs> like not joking rather than trying to fight your way through quadrabulu it is absolutely dumb i will state specifically I mentioned before there's a little console with a laser barrier around it. You can actually walk behind it and wedge yourself so that way your the lasers are between you and the spawn point and it'll stop them from being able to pull you in. So if you have any ranged attack, aka you're a force, or if you're willing to really sit there and whittle them down with the ranger, maybe you have something that reduces their health or something else, then it is doable. But I'm just going to warn you, fun with an asterisk. <laughs> you have to know about that. So anyway, we're going to go into more universal quests. So what do you do after you've maybe you've beaten normal, you you know, you've you played some of these side quests, maybe you even got to participate in some HBR quests, which rotate depending on the month. I don't think we talked about that. So let's say you did those and you're like, OK, well, what else is there to experience within PSO that a lot of people play? And we're going to start with probably one of the most Famous quests of episode one. I almost feel like it doesn't need an introduction, but it is a beginner video, so we're, we're going to talk about it. It's Towards the Future. Towards the Future is a VR quest in episode one that is essentially the equivalency of a boss rush. So you could go all the way from forest all the way into ruins. There's only a couple rooms in between each of the bosses. Each of the rooms has a gimmick, potentially, to speed it up if enemies spawn in them. So for example, at the start, you'll fight what's a giant Hilda bear. And if you kill that, you could skip all the other enemies in the room. So I recommend taking a look at how people clear it or maybe just joining a game casually so you could get an idea of where some of the hidden walls are and things of that nature to speed up the gameplay. But even on its own, even if you don't know those things, it's still a pretty decent quest for experience and being able to potentially get boss drops. Now, this quest does allow telepipes. In fact, it, it factors into a few strategies in multiplayer for people waiting to kill a specific enemy that spawns after X seconds. Yes, that is a thing. No, I don't understand why they did that. Um, so it, it, it's interesting. Some people can pop into this quest and the next one that I'm talking about in order to just check boxes real quick. So if your character truly has no items, you could technically just turn right from the start, pop the boxes, see if there's anything you want in there, and just quit out. And or just beat the dragon boss. I guess I'll I guess I'll spoil the episode one first boss of the game's name, I guess. Um, because that might give you some okay gear for where you're looking to start out. Maybe you're trying to get further in caves or something like that in your normal gameplay. So this quest is recommended for when you're able to actually beat the final boss, or at least close to beating the final boss. A lot of tricks that people use to level either involve uh, doing slash lobby or quitting out of the game, essentially. After they get to a boss, they can't really quickly clear and just repeating it over and over. So, for example, if you have good weapons for the first boss of the game and your weapons are kind of mediocre to bad for the second boss of the game, killing dragon over and over very rapidly does result in a decent amount of experience. Right, so your your mileage will vary with the quest. It is how comfortable are you de with dealing with bosses, or maybe perhaps you're just like, I want to get better at bosses in preparation for uh, higher difficulties. Things of that nature. Maybe you just want to learn more about their patterns. This is still probably the fastest way to experience the bosses in episode one. So let's talk about uh, a couple of other quests. We'll start with one of my favorite quests to do, especially during... Um, Events such as Easter or Halloween. Chad probably knows where I'm going with this. It's Terrell's Ego. It's a custom quest for Affinia. It is also a VR quest. And man, oh man, chat, it is one of my favorite quests in the entire game. So what is it? It also goes from start to finish to the end. However, there are a ludicrous number of enemies. So while Towards the Future, or TTF, really focuses on being able to get to the bosses quickly, and your fun times will depend on how quick you are to kill the bosses, Trolls Ego is kind of the opposite. There are bosses, 
in Trails Ego. There's even ways to potentially speed up rooms. There's a lot of optional waves. Um, learning the layout will speed it up a little bit, in particular for things like caves. However, Trails Ego's focus is tons of enemies. So if you're playing in casual, let's say free mode, and you just go into a dungeon, seeing more than like four or five enemies in a room is it's kind of rare. Like, it might happen like once, where like if it quote unquote happens, it's because, you know, another wave spawns in as you complete the other one. Terrell's Ego doesn't play by those rules. Terrell's Ego is like, you know what you want to fight? 14 Boomas. <laughs> So if you are really good at crowd control or dealing with massive amounts of enemies, let's say you have, you picked up a giant sword messing around, like, a, or if you picked up like a partisan as a hunter, or maybe even picked up a shotgun as a ranger. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> just, just phenomenal amounts of enemies. It's also pretty good for finding rare enemies, as you might imagine, because there are just so many enemies in any particular area that you could skip some of the areas you're not as interested in and just focus on the massive, massive amounts of enemies within that particular quest. And when you're in those events where things like Easter eggs drop or Halloween cookies drop, or even to some extent coal and Christmas can potentially, or not coal, presents can potentially drop from killing random enemies, this quest just has it all. It, it potentially just has a lot of really easy, generally to kill enemies, as long as you aren't like literally in the first like five or six levels of the game. Otherwise, it's just like really nice experience. If you're not really a big fan of bosses and you're looking at other way to just kind of test your limits on how many enemies you can handle at once, or maybe you just really want to see how effective a confused trap is as a cast, and you just want to laugh as you clear entire rooms. Trails Ego is pretty good. It has my recommendation for almost everything. Now, chat had actually brought up in our stream another quest. So I'm going to I'm actually going to mention this as one that I would also consider for new players with another another little asterisk. It's one I don't recommend doing until you're like, mm, like, let, let's say if it's 10 to 20 was normal mode. I recommend trying it closer to level 8, maybe level 9. So something, you know, after you've warmed up a little bit at least, or at least you're like halfway into any particular difficulty, with exceptions being, of course, if you're using the auctions or ult characters to get early gear, is the retrieval quest. So that's the category you select from the counter. Uh, Rescue from Regal. That quest was really fun. It's from the same custom quest maker of Terrell's Ego. It's just a ton, a ton of enemies. Um, unfortunately, in Terrell's Ego and Rescue from Regal, you're not allowed to telepipe out. However, what makes it a bit more easy, I would say from the standpoint from Rescue from Regal, is the fact that there are guaranteed healing circles to recover your traps, refill your TP, get your HP. Now, you still might run out of resources. It's very likely, especially if you have weaker items. However, it's another alternative if you just want to focus only on the first two areas of the game rather than going all the way to the final area and the final boss, etc, etc. So I had a lot of fun with that quest. It has all the same kind of bonuses from Tyrells. If you get bored of running Tyrells and you're looking for another mass monster slog, I, I would say give it a go. Now, we're going to talk about some more situational quests before we move on to the next episode. So let, let's start with one that is so specific, so specific to the difficulty you choose. I'm going to draw attention to it. And then I never recommend completing this quest because this quest is, uh, mm, it has a little gimmick at the very, very final floor of the game, which completely ruins the quest. Chat might know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the infamous, the dreaded Fragments of a Memory. That quest is also a retrieval quest. For those not in the know, retrieval will generally mean that you have to fight a boss to end the quest, so it is a guaranteed boss, essentially. What, what makes this quest good? Why do you only run it in hard mode? Where else would you re what else would you recommend about it? Well, here's the thing, chat. 
there are several really good things you can get out of it in hard mode compared to any other difficulty that you play this quest in. It doesn't really make sense why they did it that way, but I'm not really going to complain. Exactly. Murphy knows where I'm, where I'm going with this. So there is an, a very easy enemy to kill called the Bull Claw, and they decided to give a phenomenal, I'm talking phenomenal drop that I don't think they will ever change. This will be universal. Called Deep Hearts version 1.01. .01. It is so powerful, it is almost best in slot in hard mode for casts. It's bonkers. You could still get some decent alternate items too, like depending on what ID you have, you might want to look up things like a crush bullet for an okay shotgun, maybe blade dance if you're into some of the uh, saber animations. Speaking of saber, Del Saber's left arm, I hope you played through and unlocked the ability to convert enemy arms. You can even get things like fire scepters there, like it, it, it's like it's pretty solid I would say for a hard mode quest. It even allows you to get a fairly powerful pistol there called the Varista. Well, anyway, we're having a little bit of a tangent there. We're not going to talk about items more specifically beyond this quest. Because this quest is just meant to be run in the first floor. It's only... Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's only barely not the best in slot. And you can get it so relatively early. So if you're looking to get a little pump for anybody playing a cast, this is kind of like a high recommend. Like, this is just like... You have to play this quest at some point with the right ID. So check out the drop charts as of the time of this recording, because again, they could change it. So please, 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 please check the drop charts before you commit to it. But as of the time of the recording, you can get it as a green ill. You could get the Skyly or red or yellow ID. So yeah exactly so it is just really 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 good it's one of those rare opportunities you could actually get something useful yeah red for whatever reason gets double the chance i don't really understand i'm not going to question them they've left it like that it is what it is but my recommendation is clear the first floor when you find a little signal that tells you to basically go back quit the quest do not play beyond that point you will be hit with some of the worst gimmicks I have ever seen in a game. So if you're morbidly curious what one of the worst gimmicks in a quest is, by all means, get through floor two, which is already pretty bad, and then you'll go to floor three and you'll go, oh, that's trash. That's actually trash. So if you want to see one of the world's worst gimmicks and why I don't recommend ever completing the quest, uh, complete it all the way to floor three. If you just want the item, floor one, just search for the bow claw and have fun, I guess. And finally, to wrap things up, chat probably will guess what this quest is. I think it is my new favorite quest ever, but it is hard to do unless you're able to at least complete all of the current difficulty episode you were on. It's endless. It's endless, chat, and <laughs> it's endless. <laughs> it is so fun. So... What is Endless? Endless is essentially randomized rooms. The enemy spawns are not random, so you could learn them. There's gimmicks on each floor that impact a timer. The timer determines how long you can remain within the quest, of course. It'll pause once you complete an entire loop, which by default is 20 rooms cleared. Floors 10 and 20 are a boss. If you manage to pass all the bonus objectives within it, you actually get to a 21st floor where you could fight the final boss of the game. For people that are not ready for it, you can purposely fail the objectives to not fight the final boss. Which, honestly, I would not blame you. <laughs> if you played the quest and you're not an ultimate, I could see it. <laughs> people don't want to deal with that boss. <laughs> they don't want it. But yeah, it's, it's a pretty high-density, high-paced quest. It's not quite as many enemies in terms of per wave as like a Tyrell's or a Rescue from Regal. But it gives you variety, so there are a lot of IDs throughout every single difficulty. We're not even pinpointing one in particular, but there are IDs that are really good at some areas and really bad at some areas. So unfortunately, a lot of the chosen quests tend to favor people that have really strong boss drops or drops that favor very specific runs, like Towards the Future, for example. However, this one kind of mixes it up a little bit. So if you have kind of a good all-rounder ID, 
and you're just looking for anything within the difficulty list, it's a pretty easy recommendation. It even gives you potentially a random chance of invincibility for a random amount of time when you start off a room. So on top of having higher than normal enemy density, it's just, it's just fantastic. It's just a fantastic quest. It even offers you healing circles, which is phenomenal. Again, that's a thing that's not very common in Episode 1. Episode 2, it's like, it, they, they kind of have them, but they hide them because they, they hate you. And then I think they realize in Episode 4, they people have had enough of it and they just flood you with them. So the, this is one of the rare Episode 1 quests that has potentially upwards of four healing circles in one quest, which is bonkers. I, Off the top of my head, I'm struggling to think of a quest that has more than that. Like, even the Christmas fiascos don't have more than that. <laughs> and they're purposely hard, and they felt bad for you, question mark. So, highly recommend that. It is one of the most fun things to do to add a lot of variety. Just due to the fact that, hey, you get to fight a whole bunch of random enemies, get whatever you want from it. Decent experience, good item drops. There's even chests. It's super good. I think there's a super long episode four with five yeah it's like it's really hard to think of anything that competes with it especially not at the pace that you could potentially receive them here so if you learn to recognize which rooms give those healing circles it allows for a lot more strategy so unlike something like a Tyrells or a rescue where you are probably gonna burn out oh i should probably skip the song sorry chat i just realized vocals it won't like that let's get forward So what I'm looking to say is that uh, this quest is just fairly nice to you. Yeah, you only see two in a regular run, something like that. So just keep it in mind, there's just different ways to experience it. We'll talk more about some of the other quest types. Again, the intent is not to cover every possible quest. It's just too much to take in. So figure out from our segments which works for you, and then just kind of come back to the video and just... Go, okay, I'm ready for the next step kind of things. So chat, we're going to move on to, I think, episode two, unless chat can think of a quest that I have forgotten that they would recommend. One second. Oh, did it seriously not skip it? Okay, there we go. Good enough. So episode two. Well, <laughs> I got some bad news. When it comes to, re to recommending quests in Episode 2, my recommendation is usually don't. Don't do Episode 2. So we're gonna try to- we're gonna try to ignore the bias of my strong, intense dislike of Episode 2 for its many, many flawed design quests and horrible, horrible enemies. So, if you are willing to go into Episode 2, if you're feeling masochistic or possibly sadomasochistic by convincing people to go to Episode 2, then I would recommend, in particular, you have some kind of instant death special. Yeah, exactly. And some level of V5 unit, if you want to clear it at any reasonable pace. Now, those are things that generally you can't get them before ultimate. Technically, you can get them outside of ultimate, which is why I will put, a, put an asterisk there, whether it's through one of the event quests or maybe you do one of the gambles. Technically, you could be geared for this before ultimate. It's just not really good. So we'll we'll talk about, I guess, the equivalency quests. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, the, so what what are some of the issues with episode two and why I don't recommend it in general? High enemy difficulty. Enemy gimmicks often result in insta death. Uh, they have a strong series of buffs and debuffs. There are just horrible, horrible status ailments. A lot of enemies require very specific weapons in order to even deal with them at all, including but not limited to the ability to freeze them and or lock them in place and or stun them with things. So you kind of need like an arsenal to deal with episode two, whereas episode one, you could just be like, ha ha, gun shoot things. Like you just, you could just win with what you have kind of things. Whereas episode two, I really don't recommend trying to wing it. It's just going to feel really bad. And then you're going to wonder if you're bad at the game, and you're like, no, the designers are bad at the game. <laughs> they, they, they designed it that way. I don't know why, but it, it kind of is what it is. Unfortunately, um, episode two is home to some of the worst quests in the game. So I, 
I was really cherry picking these quests, chat. I'm just letting you know, like episode one, there might have been more like alternative suggestions, like maybe people want to do something in the Massive Attack series, question mark. Um, but this one, it's like I was I was struggling, chat. I want you to know the struggle was real to pick some quests in episode two. So we're going to start with probably the most well-known quest within episode two. And that is Respect of Tomorrow. What is Respect of Tomorrow? Well, it's a VR quest, kind of similar to Towards the Future, where you get to go through all the bosses of the game, except they add more rooms in between the bosses, so it already feels kind of slow just to do bosses in general. And then it has one of the most heinous rooms I have ever seen. Like, I, I have given up the will to live slash play while in some of these rooms in that quest. That stupid B room is like a third of the quest and it has no right for enemies to spawn that slowly. So if you're willing to put up with falling asleep waiting for the enemies to spawn between waves, um, it is a fairly decent way to experience all the bosses. Sadly, due to how terrible episode two is, it's one of the fastest ways to also fight the episode two final boss because they made it like that for some reason. I don't know why. Chat, like, they could have made better quests to reach the boss, but I guess you gotta deal with it, question mark. I just, I don't know, chat, I don't know. So, if you have the ability to somehow beat these bosses, or you're specifically just going for the boss rares, you could check it out. I don't recommend it. But, let's talk about a series that it has quests that are sometimes appropriate for lower difficulty, and then there's some quests that are unfortunately ultimate only. So there's a quest line called Phantasmal World. I'm going to check what quest category it's under. But essentially, if you see one of these within the HBR, I generally recommend it if the number is low to join in on one of them. Yeah, it's under Extermination. Thank you, Murphy. So the one that's probably the most played out of one to four is probably number two. Number two has a lot of fairly easy to kill enemies. Uh, it involves going in kind of like the mountain and the central control area of the game. And most of the enemies are susceptible to insta-death. So if you have like really good insta-kill... Counterpoint... What the... That... That's under situational runs. We're, we're getting there. I promise you. But since you mentioned it, I guess I'll bring it up. So, no, so if you play it, it's really good in Ultimate specifically, because there's a chance to get an Excalibur, depending on the ID taken. But even in lower difficulties, it's not bad. It's a quest that is fairly surprisingly lacking in uh, insta-kill enemies. So, you know... It's the close. It's the closest you're gonna get to a reasonable quest in episode two. Take it as you will. Maybe, maybe it's good. Question mark. I will state though that there are quests in episode one and episode two. I think also episode four has this, where they made one of the most horrific decisions I've seen in uh, these kinds of series, which is a cinematic view to the final room of any given quest. It's not in every quest series, but if you ever see a warp and a little button next to, you, to it, please hit the button. Please, please hit the button. Please don't take the warp and don't touch the... And, and by not taking the button first. Take the button. Push the button. Make sure it tells you the button. <laughs> it's told you the camera is disabled. Or you're in for a very bad time. I don't know why they thought in a game with so many enemies and potentially different players and enemies that are also extremely huge, why, like, a worm's eye view would ever work. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, but they, they they did it. So the quest itself is like fairly, you know, fairly full of enemies. It's not like overwhelming numbers like a Tyrell's. It's maybe even a little under some of the other quests that we've recommended. But yeah, there, there's enough of a stream. There's not like really long delays between them. The, the sizes of them are fairly reasonable if you're not a high level. You could probably get through them without too much of an issue. I will state, though, that there are some quests that give rewards after completing the quest. And Episode 2 has one of the worst ways to dole out one of those rewards. So instead of automatically giving it to you in certain quests, like if you do a massive attack, you'll automatically get the tickets. 
Phantasmal World has decided that you have to talk to a second NPC after you hand in the quest. Uh, her name is Ellie. She's immediately after you hand in the quest, you turn around, she's on your right, and she's normally near uh, the edge of the balcony. I don't know why they decided to make that character give something called Lucky Coins and why the quest counter person couldn't do that for you. I don't know. For me, again, episode two is the we made very questionable decisions episode. So just be aware that you can get currency for it. We'll talk about under the situational quests what you can use that in. But it is useful. You can get some items out of it. It's not as strong as the event quests. It's probably not as good as getting a massive attack ticket, which we will cover in great detail in episode four. Trust me, we're, we're getting to it. I've mentioned it a few times, but we'll get to it, I promise. But it's, it's just another way to potentially get another guaranteed item. I'm not going to say a good item, but it's going to guarantee you get a chance of something. So could be worse kinds of things. Uh, the other quest that I've sometimes played has been Phantasmal World 3, which is mostly just to deal with some of the murder lilies and things like that, but I've also played through 4 when I've been feeling masochistic. Episode 2 is some of the most infamous areas in the game for extraordinary difficulty. I do not recommend doing this, so I guess I'll list this under situ- I probably should have listed this one specifically under situational. So, this one is just- oh, just oh. So if you want to fight basically all the hardest enemies of the game, it does them in very small numbers, so it is more manageable. I don't recommend it prior to Ultimate, but I thought I'd mention it. It technically is part of the series. Now also under the situational quests, a more forgiving, a more useful to new players one are the Perfect World 3, or not Perfect World, I keep calling it Perfect World, Phantasmal World 3 box runs. So I recommend double checking online the route that people use or take a look at the map. There's a lot of resources in order to do that. But essentially by killing very minimal enemies, you can reach the boxes. Why do you want to reach the boxes? Well, because it leads to an end game area, you will potentially get stuff that normally, if you let's use normal as an example. By going there as a low level character, let's say level two, level three. If you're again, if you're feel if you're feeling up to it. All the way at the end, you could get gear that's ready for level 15 people, level 20, level 25, and there are just so many chances of getting techniques, armors with slots, which is incredible for leveling up your character, um, common weapons that could be teched to give you potentially hit percentage or useful specials like your charge and berserks. It's just an overall really great quest, and more specifically, as Murphy points out, the armor, even if you don't need it, you could sell it for money. So it's just being a really great way of getting money early, in particular if you're looking to gamble the money or do other things with money. So that one I'm going to list under situational. That one's more doable than some of the other quests in the sense that if you have, like, only a couple items, you could get surprisingly far. At least to the point of the boxes where you will then just quit out. You do not want to complete the quest. But from that standpoint... It can help power up your character. Let's say you went from normal to hard. You might go back to the one in normal in case you've been missing out a lot of text, just get those items. And that'll help you build up for the hard mode version of it to the very hard, to the ultimate, etc., etc. Just kind of put that in your back pocket. It's probably one of the only times you will hear me, hear me recommend a box run for rare items. So keep in mind, uh, if you find a single full time drop, you can trade for a hell gun. Yeah, so it's just a lot of chances to get the uh, the other currency, Photon Drops, which we'll be talking about in more detail in just a little bit. Um, and it's it's a decent power upgrade. It's, you know, if people just want something simple, just kill like a handful of enemies at most, and then go get your items. It's kind of like your perfect reward. It's kind of put that in your back pocket. In terms of actually completing the quests, I would say the actual only other quests I had fun in, there's only two of them, I'm sure Chad is not really surprised at this, would be Maximum Attack E VR. So Maximum Attack will let me fight the first two bosses of Episode 2. The enemy counts are fairly high. It has a decent number of enemies that can also be converted into rare enemies, because not every enemy has a rare enemy counterpart. 
So generally speaking, if I'm looking just to get some basic rares and any given difficulty in those areas, including the boss rare, I have a lot of fun with those. So if I'm looking for just not the bosses, but a mix of things, or if it's rare enemy up in general, I'll, I'll take a stab at that on occasion. One other quest that I only recommend this this is this is like quadruple asterisk. If you are over leveled for the area or you have a full group of four people, I did actually have fun in the endless VR mission for episode two. I did actually have fun there. Actually I wanna take a small note, I realized I glazed over this. So the most confusing thing about maximum attack E colon VR is that you might remember that it's a VR quest technically, but it's not under the VR category. That one always throws me off, chat. Every time I go to play this one, I can like never find it. And I'm like, where is it? I don't understand. But yeah, it's under the maximum attack category. So even though it's a VR mission, it even has VR in the name. It's, it's still maximum attack. It is what it is, chat. So anyway, so endless episode two more meant for people that are like probably fighting something one difficulty lower than them but hey it could be fun i still recommend having really strong lockdown and things like that but you know situationally i had fun i wouldn't have fun playing it solo <laughs> so that that's where some of the asterisks come into play uh there's also a couple other quests that i'll very briefly mention before i want to go into the one i really want to talk about there's also quests you can complete to <sighs> Do the challenge mode stuff so if you are curious unfortunately it's gonna require you to play episode two in order to get those upgrades and it feels really really bad i'm so sorry it's just like i just i don't know chat it's just so hard to recommend those kinds of things but I, I figured I'd at least mention it there, even if we're not going to talk about some of the challenge mode things. Just kind of like, ugh. Just like a big side chat. Like, even if you play challenge mode on episode 1 and 2, you still have to potentially do this, which is just so gross. So unfortunately, that requires you potentially playing a quest known as the East Tower. I'm just I'm shaking my head preemptively, chat. I'm just letting you know, the head shake is coming in. So that is also one of the hardest areas in the game as it involves going through control tower. Not the hardest, but it's up there. It's not particularly fun, but I just figured you should know that you have to do that if you're looking to actually get any kind of rewards there. I'm gonna skip ahead on the music slightly. Oh boy, chat. What about the East Tower? Well. I really hope you're geared up. There, the, It has one of the toughest enemies in the game, known as the Ilgil. Its defense is just phenomenally stupidly high. So it makes doing it on anything other than normal really not recommended. Like, really, really just do it on the lowest possible difficulty to get the unlock. Once you've beaten it once, just be like, pack your bags. You're, you're not doing it again. Trust me, you do not absolutely want to do that. So, in order to take advantage of that, we're going to talk about the true best quest of Episode 2. Also, what is with the music today? Why is it buffering? Music, please. And that is Gallon Shop. Gallon Shop is one of the most important quests to know in the entire game. Period. End of story. It is so powerful. It does so much for you. It is almost not even funny. It's one of the only quests I will willingly go into in episode 2, assuming I have the resources. There are so many things to do in this quest. This will be the, mo the most specific quest breakdown we will ever have. There are so many different things you could do. I'm not kidding. So we'll start with... I guess we'll start with something we talked about earlier. We talked about getting lucky coins. So there's multiple shops within this particular shop quest and one of them involves spending the lucky coin okay music please seriously <laughs> i'm gonna try reloading it chat i don't know what's going on today so it has a chance of giving you items including but not limited to star atomizers tp materials hp materials god shields monomates random rare weapon 
which has a random amount of hit percentage. Including, uh, well, if you want to know, the lowest percent for 50 hit is 3%. So who knows? Maybe if you want a Crush Bullet or a Meteor Smash or maybe an LNK-14. Or maybe you just really like the look of Dragon Slayer. Or maybe you just want some of the Fire, Ice, or Storm Scepters. You could just roll it randomly from that quest. It's just kind of there. There is also a whole series of terminals where you can play minigames. Wow, that was like four minutes. Seriously, child, that was ridiculous. There's a place where you can play minigames, and you can exchange them, depending on how well you do, by spending these gallon points in order to acquire items. Now, what items do you want to acquire from this? Well, if you really want CDs, you could do it. If you want to wrap presents, you could also do it there if you want to gift a player that. However, If you don't want to pay 10k 10,000 meseta to wrap the presents, it's 30 gallon points. So, if you do the recommended game, I'm gonna say from the minigame terminal, get a turbo controller, figure out how to enable turbo, play the button mashing minigame. If you press a hundred or more times, you get five gallon points. In order to get a phenomenal, phenomenal upgrade for your potentially hard mode character. In particular, rangers. There's something known as the ranger wall. It requires you- well, I guess you would technically be in very hard at that point. But for level 41 characters, you could get a wall. This shield is basically best in slot for almost the entire life of the character, at least until you get into true, true endgame. It provides phenomenal amounts of accuracy. The hunter wall provides a decent amount of ATP. Of course, pr provides a little bit of MST. Again, you can only you can only buy one of these. You can't just keep doing these over and over. So unfortunately, you have to make new characters. It's very annoying. But the item you could get from those mini games is fantastic. Getting the equivalency of let's not guess the amount. I want to verify 20 accuracy. Getting 20 attack accuracy from Ranger Wall is game changing. It is literally 20% for normal attacks. It scales with this, the heavy and special. This is like, now I'm ready to do very hard mode and above with this fantastic item that allows you to abuse all of your specials more consistently. So, for not requiring you to fight any enemies, and the only thing that is there is technically a skill-based game, whatever, then you could play that. I guess if you really wanted to quote-unquote cheat or you were super good at the timing minigame, there's one where it forces you to wait 8 seconds instead of button mashing for 10 seconds. If you get it exactly at 0 .00 seconds remaining, it will not show you the timer. You have to guess when to press it. You'll get 10 points. Otherwise, if you're within 0 .01 to 0 .10, you'll get 5 points, which is as much as if you just played the button mashing game and got the max reward. So take it as you will. Figure out what you want to do from that. So believe it or not, we're still we're still not done with this quest. This quest is so loaded, chat. Like this chat, this this quest is bonkers. So what can you do with photon drops? We mentioned them a couple of other times. Get this. There is another hidden shop <laughs> in this shop for Gallon. So be warned. I will, I will list the items briefly in the different categories they spawn in. If you take more Photon Drops that are needed and select the lower category of items, they will take all of them instead of just the category amount. It is very mean. It is not nice to learn that the hard way, so I'm just going to warn you. So, for one Photon Drop, you can exchange... Yeah, it's just like, yeah, it's like, hey, I just took away like 40 hours of gameplay. Ha 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 So anyway, so you could get things like add slots for one photon drop. That's a pretty cheap buy. It's it's not the worst thing to exchange for. Uh, from the 20 photon drop category, you could get red, blue, and yellow barriers. I recommend farming those, but if you're really desperate, you could pick them up here. There's also the ridis ridiculous parasitic cell type D line where you just get a bazillion of these for a very high level defense armor for human characters. It exists. I don't super recommend it, but hey, if you don't want to die, I guess it's there as an option. It's worth mentioning. 
Now for 50, we start going into the very interesting item territory. We got the blue black stone, which ends up being a really great beat stick for uh, hunters. You have magic rock heart key, which is absolutely phenomenal for female characters. It basically gives them full access to stronger sets of armor, stronger sets of shields. You can basically complete the character. However, it's very expensive. As you heard, 50 photon drops just for one, and you might need four or more to complete a character, which is kind of bonkers. There's also the photon booster there, which is situational. However, the big, the big kahuna, the big boss of the shop, and the reason the economy is the way it is, is the photon spheres. So 99 photon drops turns into a photon sphere. What does a photon sphere do? Well, get this, chat. You can use this to add 30%, just either, if it's a completely blank weapon, I believe you can add it to any, but if it already has at least three attributes, it has to be one of those attributes. It cannot be hit percentage, so they remove that from the consideration. So for example, you could take your native 40% bonus, use the Photon Sphere on it, and it'll rise up to 70. So... Let's see, what else to comment upon that? Okay. So I, I forgot to mention one additional quest, so sorry, we have to talk briefly about it. So there's a there's a thing you could do within the West Tower quest that sets up what you can upgrade. I recommend just walking through a guide to figure out if you could bring Paganese data from the terminal in Seabed from that quest to here. I would recommend just looking it up. But essentially, that's going to allow you to upgrade your weapons. Just be aware, you can't get above 100% of any particular thing. You could also use Photon Drops to slightly increase it. But it's not as effect effective or as efficient as just using the Photon Sphere. So just be warned. Probably just save up for that if you're looking to upgrade an item. Please, please do not upgrade things that are from early difficulties. This is truly meant for the absolute endgame. <laughs> don't, don't be that person that puts it on, like, level 1 saver. Don't do that. Please don't do that. You'll make everybody sad. So this quest, on top of that chat, on top of if you did the East Tower, you can provide, you can add specials to the weapons you get from challenge mode within this quest. We're not going to go into too many details of those. I just want you to be aware that's where you cash it in. But yeah, chat, it's just bonkers. There's just so much to do here. Uh, I think specific to Athenia, if you have too many photon drops, which is weirdly a problem in the endgame, you could convert them into a photon horde, which is specific to Athenia, to my knowledge. Which will mean that you take all those 99 photon drops and make them into a super stack. It's just meant so that you can store them in your bank more easily. So it is what it is when it comes to those things. So I figure that's going to be the biggest in-depth quest we're going to talk about. It's weirdly going to be the shop quest. Because again, you wouldn't expect it to have all of those things. And it has so many mid-game and late-game options in there. And you can do it as early as normal. Yeah. It's certainly something. So I guess we'll move on to episode 4. So we'll talk about a little bit of episode 4. Generally, enemies are tougher than episode 1. I feel like they're borderline not as tough as most of Episode 2, and obviously the endgame of Episode 2 completely outdoes Episode 4. But you might find it a little difficult without a good weapon variety. So for example, there are enemies that are somewhat immune to guns, there's enemies that you have to use a gun in order to reach them, unless you have spells. This is kind of like the Force's Paradise. I absolutely love coming here with all these different characters. You're gonna hear me name a whole bunch of quests, so strap in chat because Almost every quest in episode 4 is worth running and fun. So limiting it was actually kind of tricky. So I'm going to cheat a little and name a couple of categories for you to play. We'll start with a decent way to level when you truly have almost nothing. We'll, we'll give credit. I, I think it was to Murphy that mentioned the quest as a reminder to me a while back. It is the Warrior's Pride solo quest. It, it allows you to have two AI partners, so if you're a force with a little bit of healing, or even just like a ranger or a humar, for example, that has access to Resta, they'll end up face tanking for you, and it just makes it a bit easier to level. Everything in Episode 4 gives so much more XP than everything else. 
that it's actually just kind of bonkers. Unless you're playing some of the truly top tier recommended quests we mentioned in episode one, most quests and all free roam areas are completely inferior to anything episode four has to offer. We're talking a multiplier of 1.5 to two times more experience per second overall. And they're not as difficult either. They're not like a huge upgrade. They're like maybe like a third tougher than some of the forest equivalents. Like for how much more XP they get and how much it gives you an XP, it, it does not make any sense. I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, there's a lot of different quests that people run. I don't even know where to begin if we're talking about non-solo quests, honestly. One of the best quests in episode one gives the same as the worst quest in episode four, right? It just, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it... So they just decided that it, it was, it was Sega balanced, I guess. They decided to ship it, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to be clear. I think I said, uh, single player. Specifically side story. Warrior's Pride is a side story. I usually never complete the quest. You can get guaranteed items from Warrior's Pride. I believe they give you healing items or something like that. It's a nice touch. It's not really necessary to complete the quest, but I thought I'd mention it for people that are looking for more of a discussion on these things. Now, Episode 4 has a unique mechanic where they only have one boss for the episode, but it could be random depending on either the quest or uh, RNG. <laughs> I'm a warrior's prime, says the fabled one. Thank you, the fabled one. So let's talk about one of the... I want to call this situational, because you could do this... The way I would kind of frame episode four, a casual enemy clear on the surface, you could do it almost any time. As long as you have an okay variety. You don't need, like, freeze. You don't necessarily need stun. Just something to deal with ranged targets and something to deal with groups up close. I, I feel like that's good enough. If you're a force, you existing is probably good enough. Just, you're, you're, you're already set. However, if you've leveled up and you've basically gone from, let's say, normal to hard, it's actually, sadly, probably still worth more XP to go back to normal in Episode 4 than it is to try things in hard mode. Which is a really weird statement to say, but Episode 4 is just bonkers like that. Like, You'll be completely ready at like level 20, 25 to just do hard, to do normal mode. Even though you could go to hard mode, it's probably still not worth the experience a second. So let's talk about one of the sample quests that people run. And then we'll talk about the other thing that people use to gain a bazillion experience. There's so many, so many ways to get experience in the episode four. It's not funny, but we'll start with a specific one. Been playing more, by the way. Nice fable. I hope you've been having fun with the game. So from the standpoint of fighting a specific boss. So there's three bosses. The most common one. The more easy to kill one from a force standpoint. And the one that gives less rewards than the others. Is known as Shamberton. Or we call him Scamberton on stream because he never drops his rares. But there's a quest in the extermination category called Point of Disaster. Now no. You have to be in a team that has this quest unlocked. This is one of only two quests in the entire game that requires team points to unlock. Why only two quests? Why only these two quests? I don't know. Listen, Sega, Sega did things. I'm not going to pretend to understand why they did things the way they did it. So this quest is really good for just fighting that boss very quickly. It just involves going through the surface. It's got a decent number of enemies. The waves are fairly spaced apart. You could deal with it for, as... Kind of like a mid-level character, you don't even need any basic endgame items at all to deal with the quest. As as stated before, you need something for the flying bird, the zoo, and to deal with the lizards, which ignore projectiles. Or, again, if you're a force, you don't care about this, and this is just basically easy mode the game. <laughs> Sega had the plans, but not the timer technology, apparently. So, from that perspective, it just leads to the boss. The boss sometimes drops decent items, not usually anything phenomenal. The boss is worth a lot of experience. There's a lot of ways to speed up the boss kills if you're comfortable with it. Like, for example, using Photon Blast. Did its cores, abusing Mag Invincibility. There's a lot of little things you could do to kind of flex your knowledge and speed killing the boss. You'll see people, for example, split off to go into one of the side caves. To fight the boss and two people or one person remains in the main room in order to deal with the boss when it goes back there. 
There's lots of like neat things. It's kind of a fun boss to learn. So I recommend trying to join one of these just to experience it. I will warn you, some of the set damage can be rather high, which is like the only other barrier of entry. So if you don't have something like a uh, dragon HP or a lot of HP materials, this quest can be a little bit of a, a gatekeep with the stat checks because you're going to take a lot of damage from the charging enemies known as Dwarfons and a lot of damage from the boss. But hey, if you just go to the surface of it and play it a little bit, technically you don't need a whole ton to survive. However, if all you're looking to do is experience the absolute bonkers broken experience, if you want to power level your brains out, and, you, and especially if you're a force, if you're a force, this is like almost hands down the best possible quest line that you could take. We're going to talk about the ever infamous, the ever most played, the one everybody here in chat has played already, guaranteed at some point, if they have played PSO on stream with me. Massive Attack. Massive Attack 4B specifically. What an absolutely bonkers broken quest. It is so good that people are using it in very hard to level the characters to get through ultimate. It can power level people all the way through. Pretty sure you could do a run with your eyes closed, to be honest. It has one of the most insane drop tables I have ever seen. Very hard mode for episode four is just bonkers. It's bonkers for blue ID. It has some of the best end game items for forces. It has uh, Photon Crystals, we mentioned earlier, which can go towards hit percentage of weapons. It gives you things like Ignition Cloak, which is endgame best in slot for most forces. Like, it just, it makes no sense why it has all of these amazing items. And then it just gives you so much experience <laughs> on top of that, like, phenomenal amounts of experience. So, if you have a friend that is a decent level force or you know, maybe you're playing as multiple forces. Maybe you're playing more non-conventional teams like we talked about in one of our other videos. This quest is, like, is so heavenly. I can't even begin to describe to you how unfair the quest rewards are in this quest compared to everything else. So on top of having some of the best XP in the game, on top of having some of the best drops in very hard mode, on top of having fairly easy to clear waves, with, like, I think only one honest exception, and that is the S-shape room that nobody likes. It allows you to get tickets. And you're like, what do you mean to get tickets? Well, we were alluding to this before, so Massive Attack gives yet another form of currency. I will double check the name of the shop quest. I actually didn't write it down. I think it's to the deepest blue. Let me, let me check. One second, chat. I think I forgot to mention it earlier. Yeah, I did. It's fine. We'll, we'll come back to it then as part of this. Yeah, to the deepest flu hyphen MA4 venue hyphen in episode two. Do you cash this in in episode two? What does this room... So just clearing the quest on top of getting the item chances, on top of getting the XP, on top of getting a really high amount of money for completing the quest, it gives you these tickets. These tickets could be taken into episode two to the shop quest to the deepest blue MA4 venue. And you could just get some of the most ludicrous things ever. Like, like looking at the drop list that this stuff can give you is just, like, I'm still like blown away. Like, I don't understand why they let players do this. So this is another way, a really great way to get money. So let's say for example, you go ahead and you play for the first time. There is either a 7, well, for the first time, it's an 11% chance. You will just end up getting 200,000 Masetta. It costs five tickets to do the gamble, quote unquote. And you could end up with more money than you would get in normal and hard mode from hours of gameplay from completing one quest. <laughs> <laughs> it lets you, yeah, exactly. It lets you feed a mag. It lets you go absolutely wild with gambles. Like, even just doing this quest a few times in hard mode and maybe very hard, you can end up with so much money that you could basically pay for almost everything. And it's just crazy how much of an advantage it gives you as a new player. If you're able to clear this quest at all, 
And I, I really recommend either if you're forced doing it solo, if you're in a group, at least bring one force. Highly, highly, highly recommend. They, you could take advantage of shift to deban and debuffs on top of that. Um, it, it just like, it could give you samurai armor is okay. It's not too phenomenal. However, it could give you Girasol, which is in, just again an absolutely bonkers weapon. Like imagine. <laughs> Imagine you're sitting there in hard mode and you're sitting there with like, oh, I got like a, I got like a 150 saber. Maybe I got like 200. Maybe I got like a decent rare. Maybe we get as high as 300. We're talking like we're being really generous here. Like imagine if instead you just went to hard mode, you did a couple of quests in episode four, and then you roll the gear soul, which is a 7% chance, I think, by default. Um, it has over 500 attack power. <laughs> And it's usable by every class in the game. So, like, that weapon alone will carry you through everything. <laughs> like, it is... It's not, like, best in slot, but it's one of the best in slots. So, it, it can really carry your characters. And again, like, we were talking about how, like, you need a melee weapon to deal with enemies. Well, guess what? You can just randomly give it, be given a great item to deal with those enemies. I don't understand why. If you play the lottery enough and you're tired of getting materials and grinders from it or tired of getting 200,000, if you win enough grand prizes, eventually, after giving you uh, four items, including the samurai armor, a girasol, friend ring, and a photon crystal, photon crystals being amazing, by the way, um, you could just start getting photon drops. 7% chance every time you roll it, potentially, to end up with uh, a photon drop. Now, if you do end up getting the samurai armor, it will decrease the chances, unfortunately, down to 3%, I believe. It's kind of weird how the gamble works. It's not like per item it removes it. I think it's just kind of like specific to samurai armor. It's very weird. It's just kind of a whatever. It is what it is. However, you now have a potential way of getting extra photon drops. All of the enemies already have fairly high and generous photon drops throughout the entire quest. There's a lot of enemies that give guaranteed drops, like the Rappies. So you can also just get phenomenal techniques. There are tons of boxes towards the end, so you could potentially get armor and weapon upgrades. What a what a crazy quest. Yeah, it, it like flip-flops around. It's it's one of those things. I'm not going to get too bogged down with the numbers. But just to give like a rough idea of like the odds, I feel like that's good enough, as it were. One thing I will state, the only downside is if you do die in the quest, it reduces how many tickets you receive from a massive attack. So if you're playing one of those, remember to bring your escape dolls if you picked up any. Because if those revive you, you actually don't take any ticket penalty when you die. So, you could die like eight times, but if you have eight escape dolls, oops, it's just going to give you as many tickets basically as you want. So, just thought I'd point that quest out in particular. It's one of the best quests in the game. It's really, really, really hard to compete with how good that quest is. I don't know what they were thinking, chat, but we'll take it. So we'll talk about some of the other variations of the quests. I, th I think they're kind of situational. Uh, there are a lot of different massive attacks under the list, so I just want to be clear, we're talking specifically about 4B. Or excuse me, it's 4th stage 2B, excuse me. Let me not confuse people. Correct my own notes for later. The only thing you think defeats is DTF for ring red ring chance, something like that. So from that perspective, let's say you get bored of running uh, B, which emphasizes a lot of zoos. A is decent for Marissa's. C is like the quest to do for Dwarfons. It also has a few Gertabulus. When you're bored of running A, B, and C, when you're when when you're when you're tired when you're tired of just winning on a particular quest, you could choose R, which stands for random and it randomly shuffles the surface and underground with the A, B, and C variants. Then we're going to go into another phenomenal quest to do that I would recommend, and that is the Massive Attack E, which will lead to a guaranteed St. Million slash... like spawns of three or four dwarf on three in a row, something like that, which leads to the St. Million, which is kind of nice. I 
don't know why I wrote Shambrid in there. Pretty sure I meant Kondryu. So this quest can re-roll as well as the Point of Disaster quest can re-roll for the rare boss known as Kondryu. Yeah, I was gonna say Scambrid in, yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. So, so this particular quest will always be Saint Million unless it random roll and upgrades to Kondryu. Both of those drop extremely good items on the highest difficulties. They're okay to fight. I don't super, super recommend it unless your team can clear fast. If you can clear the boss fast, it's good XP. But I just want to draw attention to those in particular. It's just so, so, so good for uh, hitting experience and those kinds of items. So almost all my recommended quests is kind of a cheat. It's almost everything in Massive Attack series. I would say the only one that would be a super hard avoid in all scenarios is Massive Attack 3 version 2. Um, that quest was not really fun. Unfortunately, it's also not translated. So it's kind of difficult to go through without a guide, and even with a guide, it is just really, really too big. And it has really annoying gimmicks to it. That's probably one of the only times I will not recommend an episode 4 quest, like specifically that quest. So Chad, if you, if you were somehow tired of winning, you were like, you get to choose any massive attack and basically win the lottery in order to get some upgrades. There is a quest series known as the Black Papers Dangerous Deal, which for some reason is not loading for me. Let me check. These are two quests that I think are worth going into to a little more detail than the average quest. I'm not usually going to talk about routing. However, these ones are kind of special. So, if, it big if, you have Photon Crystals, and let's say you don't want to upgrade the hit percentage of something, you can actually use them to unlock challenge quests, both Dangerous Deals 1 and 2. We'll start with the first one. So depending on the difficulty, it, it changes the item slots. But to give you an idea of how bonkers it is, Normally something like God Battle would be something you only really see in very hard, maybe even parts of Ultimate, in terms of when you expect to get it. Well, I guess if you just have a Photon Crystal and you play Normal Mode, you have a chance of getting God Battle for no reason. <laughs> so, you can get items way earlier than you're ever intended in normal gameplay. So, I really recommend checking out some of these uh, drops. I mean, some notable items you could get in the quests are like Shuren and Gurren, you, uh, a red sword in hard mode, which blew my mind when I saw that. Did you know that was on the list chat in hard mode if you choose the dwarf on path in that quest? If you instead fight the Rappies, you could get things like Kasami's Bracer, Terrell's Parasol and very hard. You could get uh, Yadamir on hard mode, which is okay. You could get God Power, God Arm, great units for starting characters. Not like the best ever. I wouldn't blow all of your crystals for it, but if you're bored, <laughs> you're just playing normal. I'm not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stop you, as it were. You can even get one of the best female weapons in the game chat in the zoo. Yeah, the only thing bad thing about it is they or they have all zeros on attribute and hit. But like if you're playing a female character or uh, or even just a hunter in general, and you find the male equivalency of the monkey king bar or the Vivian, and you got it on normal mode. Like, those are weapons that are, like, mid-range ultimate items, but you just get them for no reason at normal. I mean, granted, if you want to get more Cannon Rouges, you could get them in hard mode, aka one of the most recommended weapons for uh, certain bosses because it hits things. If you just wanted, you know, a sniper range machine gun, you could play ultimate. Maybe you'll get Spread Needle or Holy Ray from the zoo arena. So... Highly, highly, highly recommend you check you take a look at the quest and be prepared to pay the one photon crystal and just just bask in the glory of unfair, easy to get rares. So if you so if if you weren't winning hard enough in massive attack already, if you weren't already profiting from the tickets, well guess what? At least in very hard mode, um, you have a fairly consistent way to get photon crystals. So you could basically get almost every ultimate item <laughs> early. <laughs> almost all of them. You could get some pretty crazy ones. Like, even like some of the best slicers in the game, like Slicer of Fanatic, you can get in very hard mode. It's just what a what a ridiculous, what a ridiculous quest. So there is an equivalency to this. So I said black paper's dangerous deal one and two. 
let's let's talk about number two a little bit more. This one is a bit more strict than the previous one. You have a uh, not gonna say tight or even semi-tight. You have a you have a somewhat loose time limit to beat the quest. So if you are coming in as a truly unequipped character where you die, uh, you're not gonna get anything. However, you could get some of the best weapons in the game on normal mode, which again is like. Just throw your hands in the air, chat. Like, episode 4 is just, like... <laughs> to, to quote an old phrase, duh, winning. <laughs> like, it just... It just, like, everything about episode 4 is just so much better than every other quest. Unless you were talking, like, truly ultimate level stuff. Like, it's just not fair. So, couple items of interest on just, just normal mode. Master Raven, pretty strong handgun for males. Last Swan, one of the best handguns for females. Period. End of statement. One of the best in the game. You even get an, a unit called the Smart Link, for an example, which reduces the range penalty for using your ludicrously unfair broken items. You even get one of the best partisans in the game, Yun Chang. On normal, you get one of the best possible items in the game on normal. I'll let you think about that and think about how unfair that is. So I wanted to draw attention to the situational quest as you can only play it if you've acquired a Photon Crystal playing one of the other quests that we just mentioned and fighting things like satellite lizards or fighting rare monsters if you're in lower difficulties. It is so good, chat. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And speaking of oh my gosh, so imagine, chat, you're still not done winning. Imagine if you could still win more. Well, remember that 200k we mentioned earlier, chat? Remember how I said you could just randomly look into the magic money? Well, guess what, chat? There's another way to spend the money. <laughs> Chad is probably very familiar with this quest too. Beyond the Horizon. Beyond the Horizon, you have to pay money to enter. It is pay to play, as it were. It's, uh, I think, 10,000 per difficulty level, so normal's only 10,000, ultimate's 40,000. It has one of the highest spawn rates in the game for quests. It is just relentless enemies after relentless enemies. The only downside to this quest, aside from paying to enter, and if you die, you get booted from the quest, is... You don't get items from enemies. There's not many quests that do it. It's disappointing, but given how many things that spawn, I kind of don't blame them. <laughs> like, this quest is so powerful. What's the quest name? Beyond the Horizon. This quest is in VR Episode 4. It is one of the most unfair quests, if you are getting power leveled, you have ever seen. We're talking like, during XP week, we have seen on this stream, we're getting over 240 experience a second. It eclipses everything. It is so good. However, caveat, you need to be able to clear it. So recommendation is usually play one level difficulty lower than what you can handle however if you have people that are slightly higher level than you not necessarily like level 160 gods or whatever in ultimate let's say they're even just level 90 let's just let's just low, low, low ball maybe even 85 if they come and help you on very hard mode which is generally not really difficult to do as a force this quest experience is just like out of this world amazing so mass so massive attack 4B, or excuse me, 4th stage 2B, is one of the recommended quests for if people are not super well geared and you just want to level, people can kind of carry you through that quest and it's super good. Playing one difficulty uh, lower than your clear speed, get XP like you're playing one difficulty higher, exactly. And the fact that even like rare enemies can spawn for no reason just makes it really funny. But yeah, the, the quest XP is completely out of control. In fact, the XP in, in quests like Massive Attack 4th Stage 2B and uh, the specifically, I guess even Black Paper's Dangerous Deal, which I forgot to mention, number two guarantees rare enemies and a specific spawn, but you also can't get items in the quest. You instead get quest-specific rares. I wanted to clarify that. I think I skipped over that point. But from that standpoint, the Force Stage 2B is amazing for carrying people or even some solo gameplay as a Force. Dangerous uh, dangerous deals potentially can be faster if you're willing to shell out the Photon Crystals. 
this Beyond the Horizon is just ridiculous. Yeah, it, it there's just so many enemies. It even gives you your money back if you if you manage to kill a certain number of enemies. And it's just it's just phenomenal. Like those quests give so much XP. We have legitimately on XP weeks gone from level 1 to 20 in a single quest. Not all the time. Sometimes the XP bonus has to be a little higher than normal, but we have seen it. <laughs> we have left normal mode in under 30 minutes. We've left normal mode, I think, in under 20 minutes a few times. The, the XP is just ludicrous. Like, you, you just can't even imagine it. You have to just witness it at some point. So if, if you are coming in as a second character, or this is not your first rodeo, quote-unquote, with PSO, these quests are just amazing. They reward you in every possible way with so many alternate currencies, so much experience, so much money, so many chances of randomly good things. It's just like, I'm honestly at a loss for words. However, it's not something you could technically do at the beginning of the game. The 10,000 Meseta Lockout is actually fairly steep of a price for new players, so that's why I'm going to list it under Situational. But if you're playing Episode 4 for any prolonged period of time where the armor quality is generally higher than anything else, and the money drops are higher than everywhere else, and the total number of drops are generally higher than everywhere else, it's not as far out of your reach as you would think. So I think rounding off our quest, there's only two left we haven't really gone into in terms of descriptions. One I technically covered, but I'll go over it one more time for clarity. Uh, so finally, imagine chat that you have all the money in the world, you have all the photon crystals in the world, you have all the massive attack tickets you want, you have a bazillion materials, you have everything else you need, and you're like, how can I win more? <laughs> well, chat, episode four, yeah, to no one's surprise, has the answer to that question as well. So there is a quest you can take in the, the side story category known as the Restless Lion. Now, this is kind of a very oddball quest. Essentially, as you go through, enemies will drop guaranteed weapon types. Their special is random but not as important as knowing that if you are, I'm verifying right now, if you're on ultimate, all of those weapons that drop with basically any special will have a 50% hit chance. On top of that, they have a chance of having multiple 50% and they can have some of the best common weapons in the game. So if you're not able to pick one up during a special event, and you're like, darn, I really need that 50 Demon's Laser to deal with Girder Bulu in harder areas at Episode 4. Or I just really feel like suffering, so I need to get to ep Episode 2 faster with the Hellgun. How do I do that faster? Well, you would play this quest, and you, given enough time, a few hours perhaps, maybe a little more depending on your luck, you will get a 50% hit at some point. Whether it's the stats that you want, another question. That's a, that's a different story. But this can end up being fodder for any of your other upgrade weapons. So, for example, if you get like a 50 hit slicer with some decent dark and maybe a native or something like that, that can end up being a pretty powerful rainbow baton. Uh, maybe you're, you've, for some reason, have been farming episode two and you have, oh, oh, oh yeah, you have the final boss's uh, drop. I think it's called Parasitic Gene Flow, if I remember correctly. You're like, oh, I just I just need a giant sword to upgrade with it. Oh, look, just go to episode four. <laughs> so chat, just episode four, absolutely fantastic. It just it's just so crazy. I just don't understand why it's so good. Maybe it's their apology for episode two. I think I'm just gonna go that's the canonical reason in my head, chat. I think it's an apology for episode two. And I feel like it is, because it has some of the best items in the game. More so if you're playing vanilla compared to Athenia. Uh, but wow, just wow, chat. One thing I think I forgot to mention with the government quests, which I guess I'll denote here, um, they can be used to fight the final bosses of certain areas or repeat them if you really want to. One other thing that's kind of nice for new players, if they're waiting for people or maybe they're just looking to have help or just have casual gameplay with people, the government quests are some of the only quests in the game where you can start them 
and players are allowed to drop in or out at any point and come back in for example so if they have to go after an hour somebody else could rotate in and play with you i just thought i'd mention that just that little teeny bit i accidentally forgot to scroll down in my little notes to make sure i didn't miss anything and i missed something sorry about that chat um as I said before, there are a lot of shop quests. I don't feel all of them are, like, must-haves. Like, I guess, like, the item present quests and I think it's episode 2. For example, you can hand in for item tickets. I, I don't think that's something most players will have. We mentioned Claire's Deal 5 very briefly with Montague. It also has a decent amount of items you can get. So I would take a look at that quest if you're looking to get upgraded items from it. I would say, like, some of the highlights of things you could make would probably be something like a god shield or from the depths. Maybe a heavenly technique if you're interested in that. Probably the most useful, well, si the most situationally useful one would be the PB increase for forces or even casts. There's a lot of quests that you could basically start uh, after a small delay and it'll have a timer to complete. Well, if you have something called the PB create or the photon blast create, equivalency then you'll be able to fully max out your mag blast so that way you can start a timed quest while having all these buffs not every quest lets you do that at the beginning but i thought that would just be a little something a little something extra to go for so sadly i do think the episode four shops are its weakness it doesn't have like too many phenomenal ones now the now the alternate quests that give random items those are bonkers <laughs> But the actual shop quests at episode 4 are on the weaker end. There's not too many items I would be, like, clambering for in comparison to, like, the Massive Attack 4 ticket hand-in in, uh, episode 2. I mean, I guess I almost consider that an episode 4 quest. Groups, you can cheese a lot of stuff with PK. Uh, some people do, some people don't. But I feel like when you have those particular, uh, PP increasers, it helps with forces. Because more often than not, they're just not going to build the meter again in a quest. And for something like Endless, where you're potentially in a quest for a long period of time, the higher a meter you could get, the better. So you just tried episode 4 with a level 46 character. Did you try on hard mode as 46 or very hard? Very hard might be a little bit of an issue at that level. Hard mode should be fairly free, and the XP should be, like, dumb. Just, just, just dumb, Chad. Just absolute dumb. So I think that's every quest that I wanted to mention. Again, it's not a full list of the quests, and we did talk about a whole lot of quests. So chat, this is your opportunity. Did I forget something that you would consider a must? Otherwise, I think we covered basically all of our bases. This should give you a lot of potential quests to try out as characters. I guess if I had to give one last recommendation for general breakdowns, I find Episode 1, forces are fairly good until Ultimate, where they kind of struggle to kill certain bosses. Um, before then, they kind of cheese everything with Chain Lightning, so they could do Episode 1 fairly easily. Rangers are good in basically every episode. They have a little bit of a struggle with Episode 4 if you don't have a Partisan. Otherwise, they could be some of the best characters, in particular, <laughs> so we streamed a couple of Raw Morrow parties where we, we partied hard in Episode 4. Uh, from the standpoint of episode 2, basically whoever is really high accuracy is the best character. <laughs> it gives your ability to land specials and maybe have traps. Uh, episode 4 is very, 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 very heavily weighted towards forces. No, we covered Restless Lion. We, we covered basically everything. Yeah, I don't want to go into some of the more run-specific stuff in Ultimate. I just feel like some of these quests are so timeless that, uh... You'll you'll play them basically regardless of difficulty. With the only exception I can think of that we named would be probably uh, endless episode two. That that one is more situational. There's not a lot of times I'd run that below ultimate, but it's I, I think it was worth noting. I will I will put it that way. It's not for any particular drop at least. Um. I think when it comes to leveling characters, if you have really strong hell weapons, I guess I'll state. From a quest perspective, episode two is sometimes farmed for experience. I believe we talked about, I think, in another stream, Cal's Clock Challenge or something like that. I have not done it, so I cannot verify. I will just share it that some people have tried that with the hell. 
I think that was the name of the quest. Um, but otherwise, like, I just find from a personal experience that episode 4 just has so many quests that you can run. Oh, I think I forgot one. I did forget one. What was the name of it? Oh no, Chad. It's the one that people recommend, but it's usually too hard for people to do unless they played it before. What's it called, chat? It's an extermination quest in episode 4. Help me. <laughs> what was it called? It has the, the lava rooms. I'll know in a moment, chat. I'll, I'll narrow it down. I'll see it and remember what the quest line is. It has, like, a ridiculous amount of experience. Some people run that if they're able to defend the other players. I don't really have a lot of great experience with the quest. I've run it a couple times. It's been okay. It, it like, barely didn't make the list because it's very hard to do as a beginner character. I've got a hunter and the big mobs are an issue. Yeah. Hunters kind of struggle, to be honest with you, in most episodes. I... I would love to know from people that play Hunters, like, what is their best episode? A and does that involve having Dark Flow? <laughs> it's just in, in, in that in that order. Because I feel like they kind of struggle with bosses, and they're not the best at crowds. They're okay at, like, weirdly single target stuff, because their ATP is so high. Uh, let me check chat. I'll find it eventually. I have the list in front of me. Is it new mop up operation three or four? I think it's one of these. Let me check. One of these has ludicrous experience. Okay, it's number three. So some people run it. It gives you about. Uh... Actually, I'm not going to name the number of experience. It, it gives a lot of experience. Just this very grueling, I would say. There are ways to minim mitigate and minimize the damage you take in order to go through it, but it, it just barely didn't make the list. I will mention it as like an honorable mention, quote unquote. I personally would not recommend it over any of the other episode four quests because I find them all easier to run and they're generally more rewarding in particular than massive attacks. Imagine helping new players and just accumulating bazillions of tickets in the process. Like imagine getting legitimate drops while playing. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of hard to recommend massive anything other than Massive Attack. Not that other quests can't give more XP a second, it's just the reward potential from that quest is just so much higher than everything else. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think that's the only other quest I can think of where I didn't name it, and I feel like it is worth mentioning from a standpoint of either playing quests as a group, or at least learning bosses. I think we covered about everything. So Chad, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here. I don't think there's any more final thoughts with it. But I think we covered basically everything. So that ended up being kind of a long discussion, but you know, all all the better, I guess. I'll probably need a little bit of help doing some of the time stamping, so we'll we'll talk post video, I guess, a little bit. But in any case, I guess we'll we'll conclude here. So with that, Chad, I think we're gonna say goodbye to youtube so if you did watch to this point in the video or the vod i hope this helped you as a new player learn some quest names learn a little bit about choosing the right quests oh chat uh i got hold on hold on there one more honorable mention chat i just remembered silly me chat i know it's an ultimate we're gonna break the rules a little bit honorable mention because chat sat here through it when you get to ultimate difficulty, you can change the difficulty above ultimate in Affinia. You can set anguish difficulties, which increase the enemy stats. I don't super recommend it for most things, unless the area is really easy for you to clear. There are some exceptions to that rule, like some people go to... Uh, I think it's Endless Nightmare 4. I'm testing my memory here without looking at the notes. In episode 1 which just involves fighting the claws from a safe distance and then picking up the boxes and then leaving. Well, we'll consider that another honorable mention. It's like not technically an item run. Some people do it as early as level 80, technically. It's not like super high level or anything. So anyway, honorable mention. Changing difficulty just to anguish 10, just for that run. I don't recommend doing that on other runs though. Enemies will kill you instantly. I feel like it starts going into the unplayable territory as early as two with some characters. 
And in groups, it's like five or six, unless you truly have the most endgame BS nonsense items. So, just, just so if you want to challenge yourself a little more, you want to reduce how much uh, special effects can activate and or traps linger, it's an option. I figure I'd just mention it. If you want to spruce up some quest gameplay, because you're bored, just think about it. But now it is truly the end of our discussion, so we're going to say goodbye yet again to YouTube. So thank you for watching, and hope to see you again next time.